So welcome everybody to our session today. Um, thanks for making time on this beautiful sunny autumnal day where some of you may have experienced the first frosts of winter. Um, so we're really focusing in today in terms of how how technology can serve the whole of society. I'm Sasha Romanovich, I'm CEO of Fair for All Finance, and I'm joined by some amazing people today who I shall introduce shortly. But what I wanted to do was just sort of first of all do a little bit of framing. So first of all, who are Fair for All Finance? Well, we were established in 2019 with a specific remit to really look at how we could support transforming the financial services sector to really increase the financial well-being of people in vulnerable circumstances and specifically doing that through increasing access to fair and affordable financial products and services. There are other amazing organisations that focus on financial education, but we're not one of them. Um, you might be sitting there saying, well, people in vulnerable circumstances, who are they? Um, We've followed the FCA definition and very much focus on really sort of saying, look, there are different reasons why people can be in vulnerable circumstances. We deliberately talk about the circumstances first rather than the people, because we do think that the situation people find them in can contribute to their vulnerability. And so we particularly pay attention to that. So let's just sit back and frame that um, that context. So we have over 14 million people in the UK who've got what we call low financial resilience. And that means that typically they've got very limited savings, insurance or other recourse to funds that can help them if they have a challenging experience. A significant number of people have low financial capability. Um, estimates are that over 20 million adults in the UK have got the math skills of a 12 year old child. Um, then you actually look at the ones that sort of really sort of probably affect many more, even more people and take it from being sort of something that happens to people over there to actually it could be any of us, which are mental and phys physical health issues, which can actually really impede on people's ability to interact with the financial system and to thrive in it. Um, and then life events, life shocks like bereavement, relationship breakdown, job losses where suddenly people can find themselves in situations that they weren't prepared for and never expected to find themselves in. And unfortunately, through the pandemic, I think many more people in the UK have realised just how vulnerable, how many people are to that situation. So what we're talking about here is actually a really quite significant group of the UK population who currently are massively underserved by financial services, which to me as a business person presents an opportunity to actually have a business that also has a purpose that can really make a difference to people's lives. Why should it matter? Well, I suppose there are two different things. One is an interesting thing in terms of talent, an awful lot of people have come through this pandemic having sort of stepped back and said, well, actually, what do I really want to do with my life? I want to actually do work that makes a difference. And so actually having a real focus in your business on an area that can actually make a real difference to people's lives can be a real attractor for talent. And I know that because we've been hiring significantly through the pandemic and have managed to bring on some fantastic people who have previously been in main, what I call mainstream financial services who've actively chosen to pursue their careers in a purposeful organisation. And so I think that is an interesting dynamic. But the other one is actually saying, you know, it should be a business opportunity. It's a massive marketplace. And when I was reflecting for this, I was um, taking taking a sort of a look back at some of Hans Rosling's work, um, Factfulness. I'm sure many of you have um, have read it. And um, one of the stories that he tells in there is how myopic people can be about markets and um, and you know, I think if, if I had a pound for every time I spoke to someone that told me they were going to focus on Hunwees, the high net worth individuals of their brilliant new product and service, then then I would also be a Hunwee. Um, but um, but I think there was a great example that he gave, which I think helps maybe sort of set a scene scene for us, which was around actually um, sanitary, sanitary products in the world. And he said it's fascinating that all of the innovation in terms of sanitary products is focused on 
largely women living in um, really the top income quartiles and you know and now you can climb mountains in this one and you can jump out of planes with this one while ignoring the fact that there were two billion people women in the world who actually were an emerging market as childbirth rates come down then menstruation goes up this has probably freaked out a lot of the men on the call but it's useful to know um, and and so actually the market for sanitary products for this two billion people in the world was massive and completely untapped and so sometimes you know that that sort of opportunity to actually say well actually where is the scale of the marketplace where actually if i serve this market i could make a great difference and also make sensible returns as they add up that that helps just maybe reframe how we think about things so this session is really an opportunity for us to really explore, well, what is the opportunity? How can fintechs make a difference in this space? And what are the sorts of opportunities and pitfalls that people ought to be aware of to be able to really make the biggest difference? So that's the framing for the session, which I hope is what you're all up for. Um, so what I want to do now is really take the opportunity to introduce um, my panellists and what I'll do is I'll get each of them to say something about themselves and to then really give us a background in less than five minutes, dear panellists, um, of how you think about fintechs and technology innovation in your business is and how you've been working with them. So give us a bit of a scene setter in terms of the space that you fill. And I'm going to go in terms of order. I'm going to come to Faisal and then to Lee and then to Tim in that order. I'm doing that very carefully so they know who needs to unmute first. And um, and then if I can get you to pass the buttons between each other and um, and then we shall keep things flowing. So Faisal, first of all, tell us a little about yourself and your interaction with FinTech. Thank you, Sasha. And thanks for inviting me to the session. Um, so just by way of background, I've been involved in the world of financial inclusion for around 25 years internationally and here in the UK. In the UK, I run a social enterprise called Fair Finance, which tries to, which offers a range of affordable financial products to individuals, credit, uh, as well as uh, finance for business, and in, as well as alongside that, money and debt advice for people who need access to that. We've uh, traditionally done that through branches and increasingly done that online. And we've worked with a range of different types of organisations and partners. So our engagement with technology, I would say strategically, we are a people driven organisation working with individuals and technology has often been the slave to allow us to spend more time talking to people. And so our engagement with technology really follows through that lens. And I think more recently it's changing, <clears throat> partly due to where we're at, how we're online and the ways that we want to speak with our customers. So in three buckets, we've used uh, technology primarily to help us reduce costs and increase productivity. So um, through forms of data analytics, integrations, access to data, different sources of information, as well as faster processing. Uh, as, and that processing including how we engage with our customers online. So how can we do that cost effectively, cheaply and more straightforward? Secondly, processing. So we use a huge amount of technology in the business to support the processing of the business. So loan management, balance checking, um, uh, managing payments and finding ways and means to do that in a cost effective way. That means that we can continue to pass on benefits to the customers. Uh, and then increasingly, probably the new area where we're using technology is around engagement. So prior to the last couple of years, we spent a lot of time meeting people face to face, doing that on the telephone. It became our next journey. And over the next few years, it's going to be increasingly through uh, other forms of technology, digital and mobile space. Probably the biggest area of insight that we've needed uh, work and support and probably the biggest learning for us as a business. Um, has been around the knowledge gap between our business and technology businesses and how important that's been for us as a company to create that as a as a function within our services uh, and increasingly as I say shifting the business from being retail to online to digital and moving us in a place where technology no longer serves the staff but actually the staff are working with technology together so it's a that's been the biggest uh, evolution and learning for us thank you Hi guys, uh, thanks Faisal. Um, Lee Higley from Income Max here. I'm the founder of um, 
a social enterprise that's been running for about 12 years now. Um, so Income Max is uh, a social enterprise that helps families um, in the UK to maximise their income. You probably know this statistic already, but billions of pounds of benefits, charitable grants, help for energy and water bills goes unclaimed every year by families, many and most of whom are in vulnerable um, situations. I've been involved in this crazy world of benefits for 26 years, I think this year. So it's been a lifelong passion for me. And somehow I managed to create a business that was very, very human centered and was able to help customers through that journey from, um, you know, having income that was perhaps not, not maximized to a situation where their income is fully maximized and they're, they're, they're able to, you know, to keep their head above water, you know. Um, it's, as I said, it's been a lifelong passion for me, I guess. And it's been, it's been a fascinating decade and a bit for Income Max because when I started Income Max in 2009, you know, I could see everyone rushing off to create things like benefit calculators and um, different bits and pieces. And I sat there and thought about my experience with DWP and charitable advice sector. And I just realized that it was all about conversations, actually. It was about talking to people about their situation and their circumstances. So rather than rush off and build a website and a benefit calculator, I created a social enterprise that would actually put conversations at the heart of that. And so primarily around a telephone. So I've got oh, 30, 30 full-time staff now who take customers through this. Um, and this journey to, to, to a place where they're, you know, they're getting everything that they should be. Um, it's been a, a crazy journey because although human beings and the telephone have been central to that, a little bit like what Pfizer explained, um, technology has been a big part of our success from the CRM system that we use to log customer cases to sort of, you know, the more um, up and current stuff that I think is coming out around like um, income and expenditures and open banking and debt advice, obviously, you know, um, often primarily being um, delivered or quite often these days online. So we um, are Nesta finalists, recent Nesta finalists. We took a look at all of the, the stuff that we were doing and, you know, exactly as Sasha described, did we want an all singing, all dancing benefit platform? Actually, we just concentrated on conversations and brilliant tech to enable vulnerable customers to have conversations with our staff online. And boy, did we hit on the, you know, the right way of doing this, I think, um, because gradually we will start to iterate. But actually, it was a very simple way of kickstarting people on that, that income maximization journey. So what it's led to, I think, currently is, is me just absorbing myself in this world of financial technology and all of the interesting and, and, and amazing developments that are, uh, are ongoing. We're sort of just trying to absorb ourselves in all of the brilliant people that are out there. So I'm thinking of like, you know, IE Hub using income and expenditure and open banking to enable vulnerable customers to, to do that. Um, Lightning Social Ventures, who were our, our fellow um, Nesta finalists, who are helping people to access grants online in a much easier way. Um, Hope Macy, who have gone through a year and a bit FCA regulation to try and make sure that vulnerable people can have um, people by their side monitoring their bank accounts um, in, in a way that's really, really beneficial to them. Um, fronted, hasty, tully. I mean, you guys will know that there's a there's a such an amazing sector out there. Um, and I think really it's it's for us, there's tremendous opportunities to help vulnerable people. And what I'm hoping is that Income Max and others who I've just mentioned are showing that there's a way forward for great financial technology to come in and support vulnerable people. And it can be done in a way that's profitable, sustainable, exciting, purpose-driven, and um, everything else that, that drives us all on, I think, to try and create a better world. Thanks. Over to Tim. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me on, Sasha and Jonathan and James. Um, my name is Tim Rooney. I'm the CEO of Salad Money. We are I wouldn't say a fintech lender, we're a lender who uses tech. Um, we're not a startup, it's year three for us. Um, I think we 
we've been digital from day one, I think, which has allowed us um, some real benefits. Um, the the main thrust of our business was to use open banking, which back in sort of the tail end of 2018, beginning of 2019, was still something that people were thinking and scratching their heads about. Um, and we've used open banking successfully to lend uh, 10 million pounds to over 15,000 customers in the last two and a half years. I think think for me, the the harnessing of technology to allow consumers the benefit of being able to borrow at, at reasonable rates um, has been transformational for those people. And I, I use Trustpilot as a very good indicator of how, how successful we've been. Um, making better credit decisions using open banking in real time has also been somewhat of a challenge. So we've tried to sort of come up with a hybrid model that still allows a great level of customer interaction through web chat and bots, et cetera, whilst giving people the opportunity of actually speaking to someone when they get stuck. Um, for me, some of the real big movers have been the, the use of uh, open banking and the acceptance by consumers. One of the stats that was told to me the other day was that there were something like 14 million transactions in 2019 and there are now 20 million transactions in 2021 already. Um, so I think that open banking is truly transformational for the market that we serve, which is typically workers in the lower four deciles of income. Uh, it's an area that clearly has been exploited by high cost lenders prior to um, them leaving and there's a clear and nascent market opening up uh, in terms of serving that population, something that the Woolard report certainly spoke about last year. So for me it's about piecing together the best digital journeys for our customer. We're learning every day um, where, where, you, where you interact or interject in the journey for a customer is very important. I'm still surprised that digital exclusion is being talked about for this marketplace. 88% of our transactions are done on mobile phones. Um, so digital exclusion for me doesn't tend to be um, something that we're particularly concerned about um, because most people have got a mobile phone. So I think web optimization for mobile phone journeys is, is one of the clear things that we think is very important for consumers. I think also there's there's the, there's no stigma in applying for a loan online and receiving an answer. I think that face to face model is is difficult for some consumers taking the step over the threshold. But there is this sort of anonymization in the whole process, which is also very useful. So, yeah, interested to hear more from, from everyone and answer some questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to fellow panellists as well. So hopefully that's given everyone intending just a bit of the sort of an insight into the world that we're talking about. Um, now, you for everyone on the call, if you have got questions, please do pop them into the Q&A. Um, you'll see that um, that in terms of the joys of the platform um, that's Microsoft Teams, there's a little bubble with a question mark in it. And not surprisingly, that is the place where you can click and then you can pop in your questions. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off with questions and I'll be inviting each of the panel for their input on it before I move into um, questions that come through from the from the audience. Now, why we're, we at Fair For All Finance are hosting this is because we're very much looking at what can we do to catalyse investment by technology organisations in technologies that really enable more customers in vulnerable circumstances to be served well and to increase their financial well-being. And of course, that could be in two ways. That could be organisations that are actually supporting providers like Faisal, like Salad, in terms of their... Um, their frontline operation, frontline operations. So they're providing some of the back office support, some of the things that will really make a difference. Um, but equally, coming alongside people like um, Income Max to provide some of the other gaps in the marketplace that exist for this, for this, for these customers. So really sort of starting to think about this landscape of what does the market look like in terms of provision for services and what are the opportunities but also more importantly what's it take for it to work really well and so 
And that's the first question that I want to come to my panel with. And this time round, I shall mix it up a bit and I'll come to Lee first and I'll come to Tim and then I'll come to Faisal. But really, to, really sort of say, where have you seen fintechs engage really successfully in helping serve people in vulnerable circumstances better and either directly or in terms of helping you to do your business better? So thanks, Sasha. Um, I, I guess for me, the I think the thing that, that drove Income Max um, really well over this last decade and a bit is that passion for change and that passion for wanting to to confront a really sticky issue that that, that was, you know, and still is unfortunately a huge problem for a lot of people in society, you know. So I think if you've got a passion for, um, for for change and a passion for helping people with some of the issues that are out there, I mean, we chose benefits and income maximisation, but there's, you know, there are amazing people who are who are choosing all kinds of sticky subjects and sticky topics. Um, you know, I'm thinking about SCA, for example, and Nicola and, and the work that Nicola is doing around economic abuse, for example. Um, I'm having so many messages at the moment around how can we solve the problems of financial um, scams, for example, you know, like I think we, we need people that care passionately about these issues. Um, you know, you, you've got Tim looking at, at like the actual process of lending. And, and as Tim said, you know, that whole exploitation of people that's always gone on around, you know, well, if you you know if you can't afford credit, we'll have to lend to you, and it will cost you a cost you a fortune. All of a sudden, there are there are people saying, like Tim and like others um, in the sector, saying, "No, hold on a minute, it doesn't have to be that way." So I, I think the emergence of of the technology that that's 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 available, the way we're using mobile phones, um, the way that you know that we just want this world to be a better place, is there's an amazing time for people to pick up that passion and create good ways of um, of helping people. Now, I'm saying all of this and hopefully it sounds really exciting and everyone will be listening to this thinking, yeah, I'm passionate about subjects related to finances. I'd love to make an impact here. But it's really worth saying that what, what was really helped our success is that the organisations that use us are regulated. And regulation does an amazing job of um, for us of of, of focusing the mind on good services for vulnerable people. So I think sometimes it's great and, and absolutely like have a passion, but don't forget that there are often mechanisms that you can use to make this stuff work. And regulation for us is a really big driver because we know that energy companies and financial services and water companies, uh, local authorities need to be focused on helping vulnerable people. And we find ways to help vulnerable people through income maximisation. I'm sure that you, if you're watching this, anyone that has a passion for this can find a way to make that work as well. Brilliant. And Tim, when we come to you, um, there's a question that's coming from the Q&A, which is behind you. There's a Money Mind poster, which seemed to be a different product. Is this another tech different product? So so this is this is your challenge now to see if you can okay. wrap that into your answer as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, so interestingly, um, <clears throat> like Lee, we were uh, winners at the Nesta Challenge and we we used that money to develop our salad Money Mind tool. So the sad facts are that we can only lend to about 40 percent of eligible applicants within our process um the other 60 percent through probably affordability rules or over indebtedness rules we can't lend to so one of the things that we wanted to do was for each and every applicant we replay back to them the way that they're spending their money in relation to their co-worker or someone in a similar circumstance um Lee touched on this earlier. I mean, 80% of our borrowers, successful borrowers, are female. 50% um, of that population are re reliant in some way, shape or form on benefits, whether that be child working tax credits or universal credit. And specifically within the public sector, which is the area we serve, they are unable to increase their hours without it having an effect on their working tax credits or their universal credit. There are six billion pounds worth of unclaimed benefits a year. And um, I'm sorry to say this, Lee, it's not your business, but there's another business we know through um, 
Responsible Finance, Scott Cash, who've actually embedded a benefit calculator within the loan application journey. And they've produced some remarkable results for those consumers um, with some staggering sums, you know, £400 a month uplift for some of those applicants. Now, whilst you can't lend to someone, if you can help them to get the benefit that they're entitled to, that's a really powerful thing. A lot of the customers that we are dealing with have very little financial resilience, which is why they're using a loan in the first place. So I think trying to, to guide those people towards an outcome that's not necessarily lending money. Lending money is not the answer here. It's about creating that resilience piece. Um, so I'm really keen on helping, in some respects, the 60% of people that we can't lend to. Um, it is a harsh message sometimes in the digital world when, when computer says no. And I'm actually very concerned about what happens to the customer next. And one of the unique things about open banking is we have this 90 day window, which can be withdrawn by customers clearly, but it does show what happens next. And unfortunately, I have to say that there are less scrupulous people out there who will lend to these individuals because of high APRs on unaffordable on an unaffordable basis. Um, so that's a real concern for me. If, if we didn't lend to that individual because we saw in their open banking that it was clearly unaffordable. I'm concerned that someone else probably using a credit score and a high APR says, do you know what, I'll lend to you. And a lot of those loans are ending in chaos for these particular individuals. So for me, I think you can't really hide behind a credit score when you're serving this particular demograph of the population. So um, there's some real learns, I think, that we we're going to keep understanding going forward. And Tim, just um, having distracted you with um, with that one that came through on the chat, just in terms of the experience, in terms of where you've seen fintechs engage really successfully. Um, obviously, you've talked a lot about open banking, but I think I know that quite a lot of people on the call are sort of interested in this, like, well, you know, there's so much out there. How do I pick? What makes it work? What what's the recipe for success that you'd sort of say in terms of, you know, for a fintech to engage, gauge really well? And then I'll come to Faisal. It, well, you can pass straight to Faisal after you. So in, in terms of engaging with your supplier, I mean, we, we use uh, FCA regulated supply through our supplier, Yappily. I mean, open banking has grown up significantly in the last two years uh, in terms of connectivity and also from consumer understanding. So a lot of the process that we have in place now is to explain to the consumer in flight about what their bank says about open banking. And I think that was truly transformational us, for us, explaining to the customer that, that it was their data that they were sharing with us with their consent. So perhaps that's answered the question, Sasha. Faisal, over to you. Over to me, thank you. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just pick up uh, a little bit in addition to what Tim was saying. I think <clears throat> one of my observations is that over the last decade and a half, we've had a long discussion around how technology can help address some of this 14.2 million challenge or, or whatever it is in terms of the numbers of people uh, that we consider to be financially vulnerable. And, and Tim made a really good point around, which I think is absolutely right, is that not all of those people need access to credit. And I think so far in the evolution of our understanding, we've tried to fix this problem in different ways. Initially, I think it's fair to say fintech's first answer to the problem of financial exclusion has been the rapid growth of high cost lending, the automation, the use of technology, the introduction of um, kind of very smart data and algorithms to help make loans. They just happen to be very expensive because lending money to people who have lots of vulnerabilities and lots of difficulties managing their finances in lots of different ways is a risky endeavor and the only way you'd want to lend to them is very expensive is in a very expensive way and we've seen that in the past with aprs and the many many thousands in, in some cases in the tens of thousands until regulation but the truth is the successful organizations that were dealing with individuals and in financial vulnerability were doing so because they engaged with their customers and by engagement, they were able to have a conversation or a discussion or in some way figure out that they needed advice or they needed benefit support or they needed referral or they, they needed not alone. 
And, and I think sometimes we need to be quite careful about being too reductionist about creating a single product, a credit product, or an advice product or a benefits product. We actually need to find some way of integrating all of those services. And so I've seen lots of very, very interesting siloed, useful uh, fintech solutions, which have been very useful in the world. You know, they've moved away from just credit to starting to think about benefits to also thinking about financial well-being. But the real challenge is trying to find a way of integrating all of those because the true success of uh, addressing financial vulnerability is finding out when you need to provide what the type of service that the person requires in that moment. And to me, I don't really think there's a solution to that yet. And in some ways, the organisations like ours, uh, Salad and, and Lees and mine and Fair Finances, are almost like the conduit points to that market of financial vulnerability. And the real challenge isn't how do we find some organisation that can provide everything, it's actually how do we, as conduits, give access to those groups of individuals, but, but more importantly, work with those organisations to adapt those services to become useful and relevant to that community. So, you know, we use a range of different open banking providers, technology providers, data uh, providers, benefit support providers, but we have to adapt those to bring them to our customers in the right way, in the way that Salad does it as well, in the way that Lee works with lots of other organisations. And I think we, we need to be quite careful that we don't think that there's ever going to be one solution or that we can do this solution on our own. There is a need here to bring everybody together and act as almost like the, um, I suppose, the partner to developing those solutions, because in some ways we're dealing with individuals with highly complex needs in extremely vulnerable circumstances. You can't move fast and break their lives. You, you need to work very carefully with organisations that understand their, their, their circumstances. Thanks, Faisal. And that's a that's a beautiful segue on that. You know, I think that what we've learned and, you know, I've heard it time and time again from people working in the sector that actually for that successful engagement with fintechs, it really takes that sense of partnership. It would just be great maybe to sort of um, share a little bit more in terms of where things that where things haven't worked. You know, what are things where you you've either experienced those head in your hand moments or um, you've looked at something and thought, well, that's never going to work. Um, what are those things? So, Lee, I might come to you first on that one. And then um, it's always joyous, isn't it, going back around these. Um, so I might come to Lee first and then I'll do Lee, Tim and Faisal again. Um, and then there are some fantastic questions coming through in the chat. So um, I'll try and include some of those as we go as well. But yeah, Lee, just yeah. What, what, are, what are the pitfalls people can fall into? Think you're still muted. <laughs> Any better? We good? So it's really, I was really looking forward to talking through a case study today because um, basically we, we're obviously working with lots of vulnerable people and you know we, we have a, a core product where we take people through income maximization as, as I've explained. But I'm working with a customer called Brian at the moment who lost his job recently and really, really wants to get back into work and he needs a vehicle. He's got a, um, a start. He's, he's actually been able to get a start with Uber Eats, but he needs a vehicle. So when he got in touch with me, he was talking about, you know, I'm going to have to use a loan shark and, you know, there's no, no one's going to ever lend to me, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, OK, OK, let's just do let's do the benefit side of things. Let's get your income and expenditure done. Let's look at affordable credit providers, because obviously I'm so absorbed in that world now that we, we know where to where to go for affordable credit. You're not going to be surprised to know that, you know, the affordable credit providers couldn't do anything. He's been out of work for a few months. They've taken a look at, at his situation. There's nothing in there that makes it look affordable on today's current situation. But of course, if we already know that if he can get a vehicle and get onto Uber Eats, um, he's he's going to easily be able to make a living and pay pay money back. And it's these situations sometimes that I find myself, you know, kind of looking at and thinking, where are the alternatives? How do we how do we help people to thrive? How do we bring around stability and resilience, as Tim says? You know, how do we get people to a place where the financial models that, that work, 
work in a personalized way like Faisal's explaining you know so these things are really really not the the, the world is is our oyster for new for, for thinking of new ways to help people in these situations sometimes I, I get a little bit well, I, I don't not a little bit but I get really sad that 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 someone can feel so desperate like Brian is at the moment and there is very little ways for me to be able to help him from even from an affordable credit perspective even though we're trying to talk to him about all of the right things and I suppose I, I spend a lot of my life thinking around new ways of helping whether it's uh, money hedgehog that can help people get stuff for free via charitable grants as opposed to having to borrow in the first place or a new type of crowdfunding where we take people on a personalized journey not for a new pair of shoes that can fly you up in the air but to give people two thousand pounds to buy a vehicle to be able to uh, uh, you know uh, to be able to live um i sometimes think government of uh, are so badly missing a trick here because we used to have you know things like the social fund and stuff like that has been so badly destroyed but there, there are we need to find new ways of helping people who are vulnerable in life to have the same opportunities that we have when we have access to capital and it's so difficult because of like Tim described the way that lending um, you know has its own mechanisms and has its own affordability processes for example you know so that was just a real life example so how can we help people like Brian that want to get on that's really the question I've got and I, I don't even know if I have all of the answers I don't think those answers are out there so I want to throw back over to you, Sasha, and the, the panel. So I think the key thing coming out of there is the extent to which we've got fintechs actually focusing on the real life problems that need solving versus coming up with assumptions around what the problems are and then going, da da, I've made this thing. Um, Tim, I know that you've had you've had the experience of the over complex, over designed. It would just be great from your perspective in terms of, you know, fintech providers um just you know what what are the pitfalls what are the things that you've seen like just don't do that <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean where can i start i could have a list as long as your arm but i mean there are there are certain things that i'm uh deeply focused on which is you know it, it's all very well being a fintech lender with no stigma and you know online decisioning but when the loan goes bad or the person's circumstances change you cannot you cannot expect the digital approach to work in that instance and one of the things that i'm acutely aware of is is you know we issue a loan we collect by direct debit we get all of those great things but then when someone chooses not to pay you or to cancel their direct debit with yourself they've made a conscious decision that they're they're acutely financially aware of their circumstances and it's about how you engage with that customer to get them back on to a path of remediation. Now, we don't charge any late payment fees. We do give payment holidays. We, we do have vulnerable customers that have subsequently taken out a loan and, and proved to be vulnerable. I, I think you just cannot ignore the fact that you do need to have human beings available for those consumers to talk to. Interestingly, uh, and it's no sort of secret here, if someone does cancel the direct debit you get a notice within a day giving them the opportunity of not speaking to someone is also quite useful because there's the embarrassment factor there but actually when our staff do manage to get hold of someone and engage with them and they hear lots of stories some of which are really heart-wrenching about spouses partners mental health family justice issues etc being able to give the consumer the confidence that they can get back on the road again is really important um so i, th I think that you, you you cannot ignore the fact that you're going to need human beings it cannot be computer says yes or computer says no if you're lending to people who are vulnerable by very nature of the fact they came to you for a loan you're going to need to have customer service they're going to be need to be very well qualified and understand vulnerability and how you can help those individuals so i think there is a blend of being able to make good decisions but then being able to help a consumer at the point at which they need that um, other examples would be how often do you remind someone that they've got a payment coming up when do you remind them and and one of the things that we found incredibly useful 
was sending a text and an email in some cases to consumers three days ahead of the collection day. And there are people that manage, you know, the NatWest account, sorry, NatWest, and then the Monzo account. And there's a lot of, we haven't realized how much juggling or protection there is between consumers getting paid into one account and then transferring the money straight into Monzo and then transferring the money back when they get a notification that a payment's up and coming. So again, it's quite amazing the number of transactions that are being carried out in real time by these consumers to protect their capital, but also to, to make a decision about who they pay and when. Um, I remember back in the day when I was experiencing, there was a colleague of mine came up with a quote, the cascade of delinquency. And there are certain things that customers will knowingly not pay but they'll, they'll always pay their council tax because they fear they might go to prison, but they'll always pay their electricity or they'll, they'll make sure there is electricity there. But people are very astutely juggling their lives in real time using mobile devices. So for me, just the simple notification that a payment was coming in three days time gave that consumer the ability to transfer the money back and allow that payment to go through. So it's, there's some really simple things that you pick up on, but again, you've got to try and, and, and test and see what works best for you. Similarly, so when someone fails as a representation process, we know that 50% of represented direct debits will go through, and that happens month in, month out. So um, working with the customers and, and rapidly evolving the business is really important, we think. So there's some really interesting tips there, isn't it? Which is really understanding the customers you're seeking to serve and their lives. And and also recognising that you can't automate everything. Um, so, you know, really being thoughtful as to when is the human touch going to be important. Um, Faisal, I know that you've done a lot of engagement in terms of working with fintechs over the years. What what are things that they need to watch out for? And I know that Howard has put some fantastic questions into the into the chat. So some of that you might want to pick out within yours. But Howard, never fear, I shall come back to that as a whole embedded and deeply embedded question because there's loads of stuff in there. But Faisal, just in terms of, you know, what's it take for a fintech to work well, either directly with the provider or with serving customers directly? What else? Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I I'll just pick up one point, actually, just from the from the, the prior point that Tim was mentioning, because my, my office is based in, in Dalston. So in Dalston Junction, you used to be able to see a retail shop of Fair Finance. Um, what was always interesting for me is that you could stand at the junction and you'd see somebody go to the ATM, check their balance, then go into the bank to ask for the money in cash, then walk across the road to repay the pawn shop for the, for the item that they pawned to get some money for some finance, and then walk across the street to what was then the money shop to borrow some money because they knew that they were able to access the kind of finance they need. And when you met them, when I met them at Fair Finance, they offered often their uh, prepayment MasterCard, a pocket card to use for their transactions. What you had here was a really, really sophisticated user of financial products and services. And that hasn't changed, right? Technology hasn't, oh, sorry, the new world, the new online digital world hasn't made that any different. They're just as complex as they were before. And they are just as discerning in terms of the financial products that they use and for the very good reasons that they choose for it. So I think that knowledge and that commonality transcends all of this, this, this kind of journey. And it's been it's quite an interesting thing to think about from the customer's perspective is why all these things are, are useful and beneficial. We, we've tried over the last 10, 12 years to work with different types of technology providers to to get our heads around how we might improve our service, whether that's at the front end, whether that's through the process or or, or just in terms of engagement. And just a couple of things. I mean, there's a there's a list as long as you're on, but just a few things that came out. One was um, language like understanding what the words you're using really mean to different groups of people. Debt, credit, these have different, they're the same in some senses, but they're very different for, for certain people. Um, where you position a repayment, a reminder, when it is threatening, when it is non-threatening, and I don't mean from a regulatory perspective, I mean from a user perspective. All of these are really, really important. Um, complexity, we've worked with many fintech organisations that have a very, very personalised, fantastic, 
uh, level of uh, functionality for an individual to use. But the truth is most of our customers for the engagement that they want for that service, they want it to be very, very simple. They don't need the complexity. They might need different products, but they just need a very, very simple version of, of this. Uh, and so a lot of our work has been spent unbundling products, um, cleaning and simplifying language, um, changing process user journeys of the uh, of communication so people get to it. Um, and the little things which, you know, most people probably know very well now, it's obviously they're not using iPhones, our customers using Android. So which 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 uh, which app store are you are you building products and services to? And then other things like uh, we work with a, uh, a kind of a couple of financial well-being service providers using open banking without really thinking at that time how difficult it was for people to have um, kind of online banking. I think that's changed quite a lot, but it's also changed how people think about data usage and whether the, the use of data uh, for their mobile phone is on a prepayment or a contract. All of these things are kind of part of a massive ecosystem of lots of things uh, to kind of think about and consider. But just probably two things that I would just add to it um, that we've learned a lot. So one, one is um, user experience and user engagement. We've done a lot of A-B testing of how people use our services. So we've understood that from, a, from an online application process, if somebody goes to our website and we've got a couple of sliders for where they could borrow money, if we set the sliders of what we think most people will use, they typically apply for, let's say, £600 when our typical loan is a £500 loan. They, they always apply for slightly more. We've also found that if we set the sliders at zero, they apply for less than they would have applied for otherwise. So what it tells you is that there are no neutral positions when you offer your services in a digital environment. And it is such a complicated environment. Trying to figure out where you're influencing your customer is, is a really, really important uh, learning. And um, that leads on to the second point, which is for many organizations like Fair Finance, it, it isn't so much that we want to work with a partner to help us do something in a different environment. It's how do we re-understand the way that we engage with our customers in a completely new environment? How do we do that in a way that allows us to be uh, determinant about the impact that we want to have? and not think about our user journey for simply the quickest, fastest, uh, most straightforward, but actually one that supplements our, our learnings of what good engagement and good impact uh, could be. So that, that, that's a little bit of a kind of a summary of how I think they could engage and what they could be doing. Brilliant. And and I think that it is getting that really deep insight. It's interesting because there was one of one of the questions that's come through in the chat, which is there seems to be so much amazing stuff happening in this space, how to find a new market to target. And I think that probably just even if I just look at the um, unsecured lending market, we estimate that the need in the UK is about at least seven billion and current provision um, by um, affordable providers is probably about 300 million so the market is is there is there for the taking and um and i think this then ties into um some of howard's com comments which is well how do organizations actually scale cost efficiently and obviously tech has a key part of it howard's got i don't know if all the panel can see the question how is how has given you options um which is do you plan to grow by a communicating directly to borrowers b through partnership with organizations c some combination of both and um do you believe you've found a cost effective method to grow and how far will this take you i'm going to which is like an essay of a question and I know Howard will be sitting there chuckling as I say that what would be brilliant is maybe if I could just zone that down because we are talking about um how tech can help us serve all of society is maybe just get you to talk about the role of technology in helping you to scale and how important you see that in your growth journey um I think would be a really interesting thing to do so Faisal I might come to you first and then to Tim and then to Lee because each of you are delivering services that on one level it needs this human touch and yet you know scaling humans infinitely can become a really a cost really um expensive business model so um so yep yeah, over to my panel um so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you in on a little secret which is for most affordable credit providers uh we spend a lot of money making a loan. Our unit cost for transactions are so high 
because our use of technology is so poor that actually it becomes very difficult for us to come up with a meaningful way to scale our businesses without radically changing. So the opportunity and use for technology to in reduce the unit cost of every individual transaction we make is, is profound. And if we were able to do so effectively, it might actually make it worthwhile for us to just build our businesses and scale them. It's not that there is, isn't a market, there's a massive market to me. It's that our ability to scale is hampered by our inability to reduce that unit cost for making that transaction. But I think the bigger area where we've all touched on, all it's kind of been touched on all around is we have yet to find a, a low unit cost for maintaining engagement with our customers. Right now, we have a high unit cost to make the loan and a high unit cost to, to, to maintain that engagement. We know that engagement is important because we believe it drives um, impact and change in the individual that we're working with, but we haven't found a cost effective way to do it, partly because we haven't digitized that level of engagement and partly because we haven't demonstrated that that engagement makes a difference. So in the world of what's there, there's an amazing potential there to make us cheaper, more effective and give us a reason that we could scale without losing money. And there's a huge amount of potential innovation that hasn't happened yet, which will allow us to make better impact in our customers. So I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Howard, but I think what I'm saying is um, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity to do more. Um, and I don't think anyone's quite figured it out yet. And I think they haven't quite figured it out yet because a lot of that work around impact is still quite nebulous. And I think technology gives us a great opportunity to do something here, but it it requires a lot of knowledge. And I, I, I don't think we've trialed it, right? We built tools and services and products, but we haven't really figured out how to engage effectively in this market. Thanks. Is it me next? Sorry. Um, so unlike Faisal, we actually have a very low cost to serve because we've built 47 rules around the open banking data that we see, which allow us to make affordable and appropriate lending decisions. There are, however, <clears throat> instances where not every bank account that's owned and operated by the consumer has been added into that process and thereby you need to have a request add other bank detail uh, scenario. Um, but our cost of service is low. Um, we think it's infinitely scalable. I think my point in relation to Howard's question is, is how do you communicate directly with borrowers? I mean, building, building a head of steam and getting digitally involved with those consumers at the origination point for us is critical. So we use a variety of digital channels that includes SEO, PPC, um, Facebook, lookalikey, retargeting. Uh, we try and sit on as many appropriate panels as we can for lending. Uh, a lot of the brokers that we engage with specifically have focused in on sort of sub £3,000 loans uh, in the last 12 to 18 months. We're working with some of the CRAs uh, to sit on their affordable lending panels. Um, there is obviously a cost to serve. We think it's sustainable. It, the, the model seems to be that. Um, I think the, the benefit we had was going from a digital day one journey. We, had, we did have a very low cost to serve. We didn't have uh, premises and we weren't reliant on credit scores. So um, I think for us, it's a sort of slightly different is how can we scale towards that 300 million through various channels? And I think marketing is always one of these things where you need a jungle drum beat continuing on in the background. And then you've got the instantaneous nature of the requirement of a consumer. It, it, it is quite staggering that when you do place adverts in a digital medium, there are people who will immediately seize and apply at that point. And then we know there are people that will take it into account, look at the, the messaging, look at the offering and then come back to us at the point of need. Uh, unfortunately, the point of need is, is still very large for the vast proportion of the, the UK population that we're serving. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. And Lee, to you next. And then um, if you keep this one tight, I've put into the chat for the panellists the final question that I'll come to each on to keep it snappy. Lee. <laughs> Yeah, a short and snappy answer from me as well. Um, I, I think 
We're helping about 20,000 people a year, income max at the moment, but there are millions of people in the UK missing out on billions of pounds of, of income through not claiming all the benefits, charitable grants, energy and water bill help. So therefore technology has to be part of our scale up. It has to be part of our plans. Um, I think for us, it's just making sure that we build it right. And I think we're building it right from the ground up by enabling easy customer journeys and, and onboarding messaging where someone can message and, and get the support they need whilst also trying to create the easiest to understand information and touch points so that customers can start to self-serve if they can um, and that way we don't get too deep too far with technology that's not going to be useful to anybody we want absolutely everything we build to be ultra useful so that we can iterate and we can create the very best platform for income maximization and to support the needs of vulnerable people. So, yeah, I mean, for us, technology is absolutely key um, because we, we could never have enough human beings to help all the human beings that need to be helped. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I've been trying to field in most of the questions um, into into them. So, um, so, so that should be OK. I think Gareth had asked one in terms of about an overview of the leading emerging technology providers and tools. And so Jonathan's put, put a note in there because I think that might be the impossible question to answer in terms of this particular call. But it's um, certainly something um, that we're we're working we're working on but i think just to close the session and this will be a sort of 30 second response from each of the panelists if that's okay what i'd like to ask you is if if there was one problem that you'd like a love a fintech to solve that could actually help transform um really the ser serving this customer base what would it be so that could be something in your business or something in the market overall and um lee i'll come to you first and then to tim and then faisal will get the last word <laughs> oh you're on mute <laughs> hello am i back yeah yeah um yeah, it's, it's a really simple, hopefully, and straightforward answer for me. I, I think just everybody on the call today, if they can have a better understanding of vulnerability and what it is that people are vulnerable to, um, it just gives you, um, you know, you're, you're inside this amazing world where we're trying to create a better world and change for people that really need that help and support. So I guess for me, the things that drive me are, you know, helping people to be safer, um, with their finances, you know, free from scams, free from abuse, um, to, to get the help and support they need um, at, at difficult times. So, I mean, from my perspective, I'd always be happy to have conversations with the more granular issues that people are worried about, especially the ones that really affect people from a vulnerable perspective. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Scratching my head here. No, I mean, I, I echo Lee's sentiments on vulnerability. I mean, predicting vulnerability is something that I'd really be interested in looking at. And I know we talked about Hope Macy and Sam Manning, but some of that prediction of what happens next piece for me is really important post loan. Um, and I know that exists with open banking, but there is a sort of slightly onerous piece where you need to keep constantly re-engaging with the customer. Does the customer want that to happen or not? I mean, those are the questions that I think need answering but predicting vulnerability is where i'd like to try and get to brilliant thank you faisal one of the things that i've learned in this world in this work about dealing with people in financial vulnerability is that probably the most important message that we tell them is that we're on their side and as we get further and further away from them by moving more and more remote what i would really love technology to help us do is to be able to share that empathy and emotion with them something we can't do very effectively at the moment Brilliant. And I think that we all know, I think the prediction still is that um, that computers will actually have a laptop will have the processing capability of the whole of humankind by 2050, I think is still the prediction. And so I think that whole sort of thinking about, you know, what are the opportunities in terms of um, in terms of machine learning, in terms of natural language processing, all of those different things to actually equip us to be able to focus the human touch on where it's needed most. So 
everybody i hope that you found that interesting insightful i certainly have massive thanks to my panelists to lee healy to faisal and to tim i think probably the thing that i would leave you with is that the the size of the opportunity in this marketplace is enormous there aren't enough people who are focused on this customer group and how we serve them brilliantly well. And I know that from us, from a fair for all finance perspective, but also from those others on the call, we're passionate about actually ensuring that we can grow and thrive our businesses and actually help this customer base to really thrive. So if you've got an idea, if you think it could be brilliant, um, talk to us and um and or talk to the others on the call because we can connect you with people who can help you do brilliant work to make a difference so i'll finish that on an aspirational note um, for the afternoon and thanks everybody who took the time out to join us thank you